Thank you, ladies. We uh, love it when you play for the Lord and play for us. What a great hymn. I love uh, the phrases, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor. And what a fitting prayer uh, for us tonight as God's people as we ready ourselves to open up the pages of his book. Heavenly Father, we've entered into these gates once again with thanksgiving in our hearts. How thankful we are for all that you have done and are doing and have pledged yourself to do in our lives. We stand in awe of such grace and mercy. And we really have come again tonight to worship our great God and our Savior, the, the fairest one of all. And you have taught us that no matter where we turn into the book that we are engaging the very words of Christ, the words of life. And uh, so, Lord, we desire to honor you as we allow the Holy Spirit of God to make us good and diligent students uh, of the word of God. So that's our prayer. I pray that uh, we will handle your word in such a way so that we demonstrate the fact that we really do cherish you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Boy, July is a great month. Many of you have testified. I'm thinking not only of tonight, but in previous uh, weeks, uh, July is a pretty um, significant anniversary month for many of you and many of us, especially in regard to, uh, to wedding anniversaries. And some of you uh, have arrived at and even uh, superseded the 50th year mark, which is an absolutely amazing and wonderful thing. Uh, Anne, will, Anne and I will be celebrating our 38th wedding anniversary towards the end of this month, but July is uh, somewhat of an anniversary date in regard to our study as well. It was in July of 2012 that we began our study here in the Epistle of James. If you've looked at, no, I, I can't believe how quickly we've moved through the epistle. And if you, I, I'm serious, if you look at where we are at, it's uh, amazing. We are nearing the end. And uh, although it'll probably take us a year to do it, uh, I, I just can't believe uh, that we um, have come as far as what we've come. And you know this, I've shared uh, it with you before, and sorry, I'm not sure why I'm terribly emotional about it, but, and this isn't a surprise to you, I, I have a long extended prayer, um, you know, between uh, me and God in, in regard to our studies, uh, and uh, you know very well that uh, when I have the privilege of beginning a, a new study uh, with you, I, I'm not only thinking that it's a possibility, but I'm actually praying that uh, the Lord will interrupt our study. Now, the thing is, we love our earthly sojourn, and the thing is, we want to live our lives in such a way so that we're not ashamed at, uh, before him at his coming. A and the thing is, especially with a view to James, that we want to make sure that we're living the truth that we're learning in here absolutely crucial we want to be faithful but not just faithful also passionate about obeying not just the commands and not just the calls but the commissions of christ we want to magnify the lord jesus christ with both lip and life we want to take advantage of and even aided by the spirit create opportunities to share the lord jesus christ with the lost and dying world we want to continue to evangelize and we want to continue to edify. But all of that having been said, even so come, Lord Jesus. And I would love it if we finished, and we'll never really finish, but I would love it if we had to finish our study of the Epistle of James in glory. So happy anniversary to y'all. Three years and running. We have a ways to go, but I, I guess I didn't complete that thought. If you look uh, at the epistle as a whole, we are uh, certainly way more than halfway, 
and, uh, but, but James has got some wonderful and vital things for us yet. Uh, having said all that, uh, you probably may recollect, although we've been away from our study for a week or two, that we are hovering over uh, James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. I'll go ahead and read the text with you and for you, uh, especially since we've been away from it for a bit. James 4, beginning with verse 13 and reading through the 17th verse, here we go. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore... To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. By the way, we're not ready for verse 17 yet, but we noted moving into this section that we have a couple of very familiar verses, and verse 17 is one of them. In fact, just today within the context of church, I heard one of you uh, quote this verse. It's that vital. We are often referencing that, and uh, we, uh, we will be with that particular verse shortly. I remind you that back in verse 13, James warns us of a practical atheism. God has got our attention because we are philosophically as far removed from atheism as you can get, and yet amazingly so, your and my life, if we're not careful, can be marked by a practical atheism. Oh, we know that God exists, but it's very possible for us to live our lives, at least for short seasons, as if he does not. And one of the practical ways that we demonstrate practical atheism in our lives is when you and I make plans without God. And that's really James' focus focus here. Then in verse 14, James cites two practical reasons why we shouldn't make future plans without God. One, we don't know what tomorrow holds. And two, we may not even be here tomorrow, for life is like a vapor here today and gone tomorrow, as you know. It's in verse 15, then, that James addresses those who would say, based upon his strong practical teaching, uh, it's in verse 15, then, that James addresses those who would say, hey, if I don't know what tomorrow holds, and if I don't know if I'm even going to be here tomorrow, then why make any plans at all? We noted that James, on behalf of God, and this is very significant, is not here pushing for a planless life. I can assure you that that is not honoring to God, but rather James is pushing on the part of God's people that they would be operating exclusively not on their own plans or um, not on their own plans and certainly where they wouldn't be living planless lives, but rather they would be operating exclusively on God's plan for their lives. By the way, that makes a difference tomorrow morning when we wake up if you and I are operating on God's plan. We've noted this before. We do so with joy. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And you and I don't know whether we will be here tomorrow, but I can assure you that if we are here tomorrow, if, if, the, if God once again tomorrow, um, graciously breathes physical life into us, then I can assure you that it's with the divine intent intent that you and I would be functioning with the perfect will of God, the perfect plan of God for our lives. It's Jeremiah 29, 11 again, right? I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Why wouldn't we absolutely, with passion and faithfulness, order our lives according to the perfect plan of God? And it's kind of neat. We even know the mechanics, and this is sort of Christianity 101, which is often James' approach with us. You, you, you take. I love this again. The mechanics. You and I see and understand 
the perfect plan of God for our lives via the inscripturated word of God and being led by the Holy Spirit of God and that bathed with heart cries on the part of God's people. Three simple component parts. You need the word of God, you've got it. You need the Holy Spirit of God, you've got him. And you need to pray. And again, we're talking obviously about genuine heartfelt prayer, uh, which is a given when you listen to God speak about this wonderful medium that he has uh, left us where we, where we can be faithfully and, uh, and passionately talking to our great God and our Savior. That, that's verse 15. Tonight, verse 16, take a look as I reread. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Verse 16 reveals the motive of the businessman that we were introduced to back in verse 13 and what he said. So let me remind you of that by way of reading. Uh, verse 13, you recall, Go to now ye that say, and here's the man, the businessman, today or tomorrow, I will go into such a city and continue there for a year and buy and sell and get gain. By the way, I can say this to you now, and there's some significant things here, and there are also some practical realities. It isn't that we, um, it isn't that we shouldn't be concerned about physical things in measure. But, but I'm telling you, you could almost weep when you read through verse 13 and see how it, it just absolutely circumvents God. And as I read that, I shudder to think that there could be even a single day, yea, a moment in the course of a day where, where such would, would um, reflect uh, on my life. Again, God, help me in connection with that. So James makes it explicitly clear the motive of this businessman back in verse 13 is selfish pride. A self-consumption. It's yet another reason why I know that we need to touch base with and do business with God on a daily basis. Christ didn't make a mistake when he said that we need to take up our cross daily and follow him. We need to continue to meet with God. We need to continue to allow the Spirit of God to be in control of our hearts and lives because that's where we not only will have the propensity for following the plan of God, but we will passionately want it. And uh, that is extremely pleasing to God. But, but sadly, here, this businessman, he's motivated by selfish pride. He's not only making plans without God, but he's actually boasting about it. Could we ever do that? Could we ever just make our plans and neglect God and then that be the priority in regard to our talk? Could we ever boast in such a way? I'm reminding you, again, this is basic Christianity 101, right? Pride distances us from God. Pride distances us from the plan of God. We do not pride our way to the will of God, we pray our way to the will of God. And again, emphasis on a submissive and humble spirit in crying out to God and asking for his help as we, using the scriptures and the Holy Spirit of God, seek to live out his perfect plan for our lives. James says, you rejoice in your boastings. I wanted to say a word about the, the word rejoice. It's familiar to us. You'll find it many, many times in Scripture. You won't be surprised when I tell you that there's certainly nothing inherently wrong with the word. And it actually opens up the proverbial can of worms in regard to those things that we should not rejoice in, which, is, which one of those things is here 
delineated by James, those things that we should not rejoice in, and then those things that we should rejoice in. By the way, James has already established that. Here he's telling us to not rejoice. But back in chapter 1 and verse 9, you, can only turn, you only need to turn a page or two. You, you'll see James using the term in a positive way and, and, and helping us to understand here's an area where we should be rejoicing. James wrote this back in uh, chapter 1 and verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice. It's the very same word. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. We should make our boast in God and God alone. God's things, God's word, God's gospel, God's plan, God's will, God's way, God's work, God's people, God's church, God's perfect character. We have, this has been a day, it started with our chorus time this morning, this has been a day when we've been reminded of the holiness of God. And we come together like this, and by the way, it happens as, as individuals, it's yet again a reason why we need to meet with God, I believe, first thing in the morning because we get a new vision of God. I mean a new, um, fresh vision of the God of the Bible, and it absolutely impacts our lives. But how many times, and if it doesn't happen, it's our fault, not God's. And believe it or not, it's not the fault of the people that are involved in the service or anything like that, especially if the, if, if the church is is reading and studying and with God's help attempting to live the word of God. But listen, something is wrong with my heart if I come here and I'm not re-impressed with the perfect character of God. And something is wrong in my heart if having been impressed with the perfect character of God, that isn't in practical ways displayed in my life when I leave these gates. And holiness, I think we'll say a little bit more about it even next Sunday morning. Guess what, class? The Lord willing. <laughs> because I know that uh, this part of the character of God hasn't fully gripped uh, our, our hearts. We ought to boast in God and God alone. Uh, the word, by the way, is translated uh, by the English word glory in 2 Corinthians 1.31. You're just listening, not turning. He that glorieth, same word, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that reminded me of a familiar text in Jeremiah 9.23 and 24. We're not turning. For you students, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, it uses this same Greek word that we have here used by James, where Jeremiah writes, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, Mercy, tenderness, justice, and in these things I delight, say the Lord. And I have to share with you Galatians 6.14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same word. You and I have only one legitimate boast. It's the cross of Christ. It's the Christ of the cross. Boy, that'll change our lives. That will enter into virtually every discussion, virtually every conversation. It will hold sway with every act and even every thought. I tell you again tonight that the best thing about us and the only thing that we can boast is Jesus. We have only one legitimate boast. You can take it to the bank. By the way, in the 
th this is interesting. I wanted to note this with you and do so in passing. Uh, another n place where the word rejoicing or boasting or glorying is used in the negative is in familiar Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Same word. For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's our word. We have one legitimate boast. It is the cross of Christ. And by the way, when you envision the cross, and we know that is the heart of the gospel, not the end of the gospel, we know that's the heart of the gospel. But when you, um, when you envision the cross of Christ, it is impossible from a contextual standpoint for you and I to do that with pride. Because the reason why he's there, the reason why he's hanging, the reason why he's been pierced through, the reason why he's suffering, the reason why he's been bruised is because of your and my sin. We have one legitimate boast, it's the cross of Christ. James is speaking of a selfish, self-centered, prideful rejoicing. And we ought not to do it. He goes on to, and I love this for our Wednesday nighters. Uh, but by the way, thank, thank you again for being here. I... I was going to say a little bit earlier that we have, uh, you know, we have just a skeleton crew tonight, but you guys are way too good looking to, for me to use that analogy that you're a skeleton crew. Y you know, I, I'll tell you how foolish I am. And I sure trust that this, you know, has nothing to do with me from a selfish and prideful standpoint. I, 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 I reflect honestly, wholly, on um, the greatness of our God. And I'll tell you, I don't think it's a naivety on my part, a naivety, na where I'm being naive. How do you say that? Huh? Naivety? I, I don't think it's that on my part. But I, I am always taken back when we gather in this place and, and every pew isn't filled. And, and there's two sides to that coin. I, uh, you know, one, I, I know just how pleasing it is to God that you are filling one of the seats here. But I always wonder about what God thinks. Uh, you know, when, when the majority of us don't come back. Sorry, I just was thinking and often think about those things, and my resolve is, again, what does God, you know, deserve? And uh, I, I'm just glad that you're here, and I'm certainly glad that I'm here as well. James is speaking of a prideful, self-centered rejoicing and he goes on to describe it as evil. Again, I'm rereading verse 16. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. I'm back to my initial comment with you here. Uh, and, and, and that is uh, in, in regard to our Wednesday nighters. I love the timing of this. And God, the Spirit of God, again, orchestrates everything. And uh, here, here we were, I think just last Wednesday night. And uh, God was reminding us of the fact that in regard to this English word evil, that there are two primary Greek words that stand behind it. The first is kakos, and I think that I have a little bit better way to express this. I shared with our Wednesday nighters that there's kakos is, is a Greek word that means evil, often translated that way. In other words, when you're reading in the New Testament and you come across the word evil, it may have behind it the Greek word kakos. And it means bad. There's nothing good about it. It does mean evil. It's a good translation. But I shared with our Wednesday nighters, and I think I've shared it before, that there's almost like a contentment to this evil. And, and, and in such, it's distinguished from the other Greek word for evil. There's almost a contentment, but I think a better word is there is, there, there's, 
a, a lack of recruiting with this kind of evil. I think that's probably a better term. Kakas is, is an evil, but it lacks recruitment, which means that this is someone or something that's evil and content to be evil in and of themselves. But paneros, the other Greek word behind our English word evil, is, is in contradistinction to that. It too means evil, but this is a recruiting evil. This is someone who is evil in and of themselves and then seeks to make other people evil. And of course, having noted that with you and to um, just highlight that that is the term that James uses as he writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God here, um, you're, you're, you're in turn not surprised when I remind you, and again, a, a double reminder for our Wednesday nighters, that, uh, that, that it's this Greek word that actually is one of the titles, one of the names of Satan. He is the evil one. In fact, this is an interesting expression, and I probably shouldn't do this little rabbit tra trail, but I think we can do it quickly. In 1 John 5.19, it says, the whole, you're familiar with the terminology, the whole world lies in the lap of wickedness. And it's a very good translation. But what's interesting from a grammatical stomp, standpoint is the, is the phrase wickedness, the word wickedness, is actually a phrase in the Greek. In fact, it's toponaru, actually toponaro. That's how you would read it in the Greek. And the to is a definite article, so it's the wickedness. It's not just wickedness, it is the wickedness. And then the other grammatical aspect of the term is panaru, from panaras, is in the masculine gender, which indicates that at least potentially it's speaking of a person. A literal translation, the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. The whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. Who is that? It is Satan. He isn't content to be evil in and of himself. He is absolutely with passion, seeking to take many, many with him. That's why as God even of late in regard to Sunday morning is sort of indirectly reminding us of Satan's fall that we're not surprised as we read the narrative concerning that, that he takes many, many, many other angels with him. Why? Because he is the Paneros one. Oh, we need to continue to teach and preach it because lives are at stake. Our young people need to continue to hear from our old timers. Listen, you will absolutely regret going your own way because uh, James really is reminding us that if we're not operating on God's plan, we're operating on our own. And guess what? When we're operating on our own, we're actually doing Satan's thing. Wow. Isn't it amazing how quickly God's people can move from Christ's camp to Satan's camp? Isn't it amazing how quickly and practically we can move from doing the righteous thing to doing the very things that ultimately please our enemy, the evil one. Listen, when we make plans without God, James would say, we are doing Satan's thing. And I leave you with this. You recall speaking of Lucifer, Satan. You, you recall in Isaiah uh, 14, his five I wills. As uh, God gives us the mechanics of Satan's fall, he said, I, I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit, I, I will um, ascend above the clouds, I will be like the most high, you recall. Warning. If we're not careful, such prideful, God-forsaken words can drop from our lips. I will go here, I will go there, I will do this, I will do that. Where is your God? Make plans, but make them with God. Follow a plan for your life, but make sure that you're following with passion and faithfulness 
the perfect plan of God. As Brother John reminded us with such terminology, you'll never, ever regret following God's plan for your life. Oh, how often we regret not following, but we'll never regret following. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, James, teaching is so very practical. We appreciate it. May you continue to drive these things deep into our hearts. May we be a people down to the last one who leave tonight with a renewed passion concerning the plan of God for their lives. May it make a difference not only tonight, but first thing in the morning, again, the Lord willing. And may we be conscious of and passionate about you and your things at every turn. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's close taking our uh, choral book once again and turn, turning over to 46. And there's five verses here, but we're going to sing verse 4. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Let's stand together singing verse 4 of 46. Every need is half the Heavenly Father, let the chorus that we've just sang be true in each one of our hearts. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. Lord, help us not, as it's been pointed out, when we make plans without you, we are actually practicing atheism. Drive that home to our hearts that, that even in the simplest of plans, when we leave you out, we've denied you. And, and Lord, help, to end on a positive note, help us to truly live this chorus. All, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Lord, as we go from here, whether we go out to eat someplace, uh, we make the drive home, we go to bed this evening, wake up in the morning, let all those things be done in such a way that we, we, our desire is to know you and to please you and that you are the one that thrills our soul. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.